to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guest Ellen Grace O'Brien, and she's here today to share with us her new book, The Jewel of Abundance, Finding Prosperity Through the Ancient Wisdom of Yoga. Now, Ellen is an esteemed yoga teacher, radio show host, and award-winning poet who weaves poetry into her teachings on spiritual matters, pointing to the mystical experiences beyond words and thought. She's been teaching yoga philosophy and practice nationally and internationally for over three decades. So let's welcome to the show, Ellen Grace O'Brien. Thanks so much, Marianne. I'm delighted and honored to be with you today. Oh, what a pleasure it is to have you here. And your book is very profound. I mean, there are quite a few things I learned in there that I didn't know. Man, I I, I just could not put it down once I picked it up. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. It has to be pretty inspiring. And my goodness, you know, there's so much that I want to cover. Of course, we'll never get to it all today. But why don't we start with what was the inspiration for behind you know, just writing this book? Um, you know, for, I have taught uh, yoga philosophy and practice for, for many years. And I found that, of course, students who come onto the path of yoga, metaphysics, meditation, they're, they're really looking um, to live a spiritually conscious life, which is, of course, ideally what we all want to do. And um, But I often found that right in there was the struggle with, okay, how do I do that and still um, take care of my financial responsibilities, take care of my family? How do I do that? You know, how do I have, quote, unquote, balance in my worldly life and still um, live as a spiritual being? So I found in the ancient Vedic teachings, they have um, this put together so beautifully for us and it's so relevant for us today that the goal to prosper is right there next to the goal for enlightened spiritual living. Wow. Well, do you know, there, there was so much in this book and a lot of it that kind of I was uh, surprised by when I was reading. And, you know, part of it, um, well, I, actually, I don't want to get the cart before the horse here. Why don't we start with this? You know, because there's, I, I, I've got all these great questions, but I want to make sure that, you know, it, there's a great understanding of what your book's about as well for our listeners. So why don't we start with this? What is Dharma for those that might be new to that? Um, I think we could define it um, in the simplest way as living a life of higher purpose. Dharma, of course, is a Sanskrit word. It's becoming more commonly used in the English uh, lexicon today. Um, but people think of Dharma as, you know, their their life purpose or what is there just to do. But it also has the meaning of foundation or support. So Understanding Dharma is understanding that there is um, a power and intelligence that um, runs this universe, and um, we can learn how to cooperate with that um, power and that presence. And so Dharma becomes then the source of, um, in a sense, a moral law, ethical law, spiritual law, and it, it's, it's a higher order to the way that we live. What a beautiful way of uh, presenting that because it makes sense for people who are looking to develop, you know, their own spiritual advancement. Well, and I find too, Marianne, that, you know, today, of course, our, our life, our interconnected life, um, globally interconnected is, is uh, richer than ever. It's also fuller than ever. And, um, we, we have a, an imperative to learn how to live together, to learn how to live in the highest way so that, you know, we can, um, all prosper so that we can protect the earth. You know, the, the it's as if these um, global laws, cosmic laws, uh, are even um, more important today, if that's possible. But I, I think it's one way, you know, for us to meet the pressing needs that we have is to learn how to, um, you know, think in, in a higher way about the interconnection of everything, about the, the laws that, that apply to 
everyone and everything that's part of this great cosmos that we live in. Well, and part of what I found very interesting is that when we talk about abundance and prosperity and wealth and dharma, that there's actually this connection, which I was unaware of before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's what I meant about um, saying in my, that's how the book came forward, you know, out of my work with students. And I think, and I do, and I talk about this in the book, that that um, comes from this sort of fundamental split, you know, that we've had in our consciousness through the ages that, you know, our spiritual life, our material life are separate, our soul life, our work life are separate. Mm -hmm. And according to the teachings of the Vedas, that, that simply is not true. And of course, if we really look at it, there's no line that divides it. (laughs) And um, so what we want to do is is learn how to bring those parts of our life um, together in in one um, whole in in wholeness and as we do that we find that you know learning how to prosper in harmony with dharma in harmony with the laws of the universe in harmony with living with higher purpose um, expands us and helps us um, to awaken spiritually. So they're they're really not at odds with one another. Um, they're actually in harmony with one another. But um, I, and and that but is kind of with a capital B. Um, it's you know, uh, and I'm very clear about this in the book because it, prosperity is not to be pursued for its own sake. You know, every spiritual tradition tells us that that's a dead end. And and we know that, you know, in our own experience that that you know, one desire just leads to another. Yeah. And so yeah, so we need this higher framework um that that says, okay, arta, this goal to prosper and to realize wealth is to be pursued in harmony with Dharma and the, doing what we do to contribute to the greater good of all and fulfilling our own purpose in this lifetime. I love that because it really puts in perspective what if you know when we pursue you know, wealth, what that really um, it, it's this flow factor with Dharma. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's. Can, it's something that's connected with dharma, and at the same time, when we go for wealth, when we are pursuing wealth, it's for the the end means is to for dharmic. Um, how should you say? Like it, it's for um, as you put, securing the ends of dharma in your book. Yes, it's for um, when uh, a, a dharmic purpose, or we could even call it dharmic prosperity. And when we when we see those two together. I mean, not only can we contribute to our own healing and the fulfillment of our potential, but we contribute to the well-being of others. It's it's tied to that, you know, not just for one's own sake alone, um, but for the the greater good. And I I find, you know, so many people, of course, are interested that in that, and they're ready for that. I mean, we. When we get down to it, you know, what do human beings really want? You know, well, we want to be healthy and happy, but we also want to have a meaningful life and a life that makes a positive difference. That seems to be a very big draw in today's age where people are looking for meaning and purpose within their lives. And one of the things that I find interesting, it's something that um, the millennials, that's one of their main goals is when they work or do something, is to have purpose and meaning for the work that they do. Absolutely. And and I think that's because um, they're, you know, coming of age in a time when they can see that wealth pursued, you know, simply for its own ends doesn't ultimately bring um, lasting happiness. Um, now, I won't say that, you know, success and prosperity doesn't make people happy <laughs> because it does, but it just doesn't bring lasting happiness and it doesn't bring the deep fulfillment that is is innate to us. And in the book, I talk about us having a, a prosperity imperative 
And what I mean by that is that the soul, um, our divine self, naturally wants to thrive and to um, fulfill its purpose. And so we feel that in our lives, you know, as an inkling to um, to, to succeed, um, to learn, to grow. You know, all of those impulses come, you know, from the soul level of our being. So, so learning how to um, connect this with our spiritual life, I think, is is so important, you know, to our well-being, but also, as I say, the well-being of the planet today. Yeah. Well, and so it has me asking, you answer this in your book, and, you know, so what is the, what is true wealth? What What is that? Um, I think it's connected to, of course, what lasts, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so from my perspective, I look at that as, the soul wealth, and what I mean by that is coming really to wake up spiritually, to know the truth of what we are as spiritual beings, and to know that each of us has unlimited um, divine potential, you know, waiting to be explored, waiting to be fulfilled. And um, I tell a story in in the book about a meeting that I had with uh, Ila Gandhi, the granddaughter of Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, she lives in South Africa. And at the time, I was speaking with her about their struggle during the time of apartheid. And, and of course, uh, she went through the assassination of her grandfather. And so, you know, many difficulties in her life. And I asked her, you know, how how did you manage? You know, how did you maintain um, your energy, your faith? How did you persevere? And she said, you know, there were those around us um, who had power during the time of apartheid, and they had a lot of wealth. They had a lot of resources, she said, but we had spiritual resources. And so we never despaired. We never lost hope. Mm-hmm. And so for me, um, you know, that phrase, and of course hearing her story was so profound, but I think that real wealth for every single one of us is understanding that we all have spiritual resources. Wow. What a meeting that must have been. Yes, it was. time with her. <laughs> yes, it was quite, uh, quite profound. Oh, I can you can hear it. Well, and it it has me kind of you know just kind of thinking when we talk about that. I, I know you know one of Gandhi's things is he talked about how we are all one. You know, and I love that because it really is that realization of oneness. You know, it it, it was um it's just beautiful. It is, and it's really the the law I think on on which all of this is based you know, in terms of um, dharma, you know, the fundamental understanding of dharma is that there's one life, there's one power, there's one presence, and we're all expressions of that. And there's a divine order that pervades it, and we can learn how to cooperate with that. I'm able to connect with that. Mm-hmm. So when we, we've talked about dharma and we've, you know, kind of chatted about that a little bit. One of the pieces I found in there that was interesting, it talks about non-stealing. Mm-hmm. And I'd love for you to expand on that for our listeners because it's more in-depth than I think what people would think. Yes, it's really interesting, isn't it? So when I was um, putting this book on, on ARTA, which is the um, other goal of life besides um, Dharma, and, and there are a couple others we can t- hopefully talk about before we conclude today, but, but ARTA, of course, meaning wealth. And I looked into the um, Vedic teachings that are found in many of the scriptures, but principally I drew um, from Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, which is um, the classic text that students of yoga philosophy draw from. And many people are studying that text today. And in there, um, he includes, interestingly enough, for those who want to meditate, which are many people meditating in the world today, many people want to meditate, he he brings the first step that you're going to take when you start up a program of uh, meditation is learning how to lead an ethical life. 
And so he starts off with five principles called the restraints that have to do with having right relationship with with others and um, with life itself. And so we find in their sutra... um, 237, um, which is the sutra that that encourages you to restrain from stealing. <laughs> and every one of those sutras is stated in a sense in a, in a positive way, like by the promise of, you know, when you fulfill this ethical law, this will be your experience. And so on this particular one, um, it says, in one who is established in non-stealing experiences the jewel of abundance. And so you kind of have to unpack that. You know, you study with a teacher who helps you understand what that means. But, but basically, it, it's the law of prosperity, which is to get out of that consciousness of, you know, taking from anybody else on the on the very first level you know the f- first physical level don't steal stuff right <laughs> don't take what doesn't belong to you but more subtly it's to get out of the consciousness that you need to to lie or to take uh, what doesn't belong to you to appropriate what that appropriate what doesn't belong to you um uh, or or to even to use more than you need or more than you can appreciate, even if you can afford it. So we were talking about Gandhi in, a moment ago, and, you know, a famous saying of his is that, you know, there's enough uh, in the world for what everyone needs, but not for everyone's greed. So... Um, that's a fundamental dharmic law that, you know, we, we all can have what we can use and even what we can appreciate. This bath of yoga is not one of rigid um, austerity, but it's one of um, clear awareness and consciousness. So this law of prosperity says once you come to know your own fullness, your own wholeness, then you're naturally going to draw to you whatever you need to fulfill your higher purpose in this lifetime. And you're going to do it in a way that um, contributes to others and doesn't steal from them or take from them. Oh, how beautiful is that? <clears throat> Excuse I me. I mean, when we look at that, we're just like, wow, okay, because it brings it down to a whole nother level where we're looking at non-stealing is more than actual, you know, theft of something. It, it really, it, there's much more to that. Yes, so much more. I mean, even in all of the yoga teachings, we find that it starts at the physical level. You know, don't, don't take stuff. <laughs> and then and then it becomes more and more subtle. So um, even coming down to, um, you know, not being jealous of others or envying others, their success, right? Because it, when you come to understand that your wealth, your prosperity is going to come from your consciousness. If you have a consciousness that, that envies others or is jealous of them, you have to look behind that and see that there's a belief system there that says they have something I don't, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so we're, we're really eroding our own sense of fullness, our own wholeness by not being able to celebrate the success of others. So you're right, you know, the teaching is very, it's very deep. Um, and it's really a way for us to transform our minds, to transform our consciousness, so that we can we can change our lives. Well, and do you find that when people make these adjustments, that the the changes that they make in their lives is actually being something that's being reflected in the world around them? Um, could you say more about that? Yeah, so when we make these changes and adjustments in our own life, you know, is it something that we can kind of see reflected back to us in the world around us from people that we are um, either working with or connected with that maybe they start to change in a little way because of the work we've done with ourselves? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. 
Um, of course, I've seen that, and and I've had you know many reports of people seeing that. And I think one of the first things that that becomes evident is this um, teaching that um, to prosper dharmically is to learn how to cooperate with the infinite. So, you know, we begin to enter into a conscious relationship with life with a capital L and we and we understand that the source of our security, the source of our prosperity is that relationship. It's not a paycheck. It's not another person, um, but it's that. And so as we begin to enter into that conscious relationship, we begin to see life in so many different ways coming to meet us. You, you know what I mean by that? Like you just, you just happen to be, you know, in the right um, place at the right time where you know somebody is there to assist you or the right connection is made um, this is dharmic prosperity where you find that that life itself wants to prosper you because life Im- impartially is about prospering you know, bringing all things to fulfillment of this higher purpose. So that's what we're looking for is how do we cooperate with that? And that's one of the first things that becomes evident. And then, of course, in terms of our relationships with other people, um, I think others are naturally um, affected by our consciousness, you know, whether it's positive or negative, you know, both are contagious. And um, so we see that reflected back to us. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Ellen Grace O'Brien in regards to her new book, The Jewel of Abundance, Finding Prosperity Through the Ancient Wisdom of Yoga. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. We'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special, when you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place. Here's where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com There are nearly 2 million Americans living with amputation. Many live right here in San Antonio. Becoming an amputee can be scary, frustrating, isolating, but there's no reason to feel alone. The San Antonio Amputee Foundation is here to help support you and guide you toward resources such as home and car modifications and even prosthetic limbs. For more information or to make a donation, visit saamputee.org. We'll help you live a full, active life, one step at a time. San Antonio Amputee Foundation, healing limbs, hearts, and and souls.
Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with special guest, Ellen Grace O'Brien, who's sharing with us her new book, The Jewel of Abundance, Finding Prosperity Through the Ancient Wisdom of Yoga. Now, Ellen, before we left for break, our discussion really kind of had me thinking, your book talks about enlightenment and how that's something that we not only can develop, but we can actually open up on our own, which I found to be extremely inspiring. I think a lot of times people, when they think of enlightenment, they're like, wow, that's something, it's it's a big accomplishment. It's something I'll never be able to obtain. Or maybe that's something that's reserved for those very highly spiritually advanced people. This is not something for me or something I'll ever be able to accomplish within my lifetime. Uh, yes, that's really a very common thought in the yoga tradition that I'm a part of, that um, the Kriya Yoga tradition brought to the U.S. by Paramahansa Yogananda, great um, sage from, from India who brought these teachings and practices. In, in my tradition, um, which is true in the Vedic tradition overall, there's a great emphasis on um, enlightenment as a goal of life and um, and it is a goal for everyone and it is actually one of the four goals i was i was saying a moment ago that we we, we should look at the four goals so we have dharma as a first goal in life um, to live with higher purpose artha the second goal to prosper um, and in order to fulfill our potential, the third goal is kama, um, to enjoy life and, and to um, have pleasure in our life. And the fourth goal is moksha, enlightenment or liberation of consciousness. So those four goals are for, are for everybody. And the greatest impediment that our teachers in my tradition have, have said the greatest impediment that we have to enlightenment, most of us, is that, is that very idea that, it's, that it's, we're, it's not possible for us. Um, that, that that in itself is, a, is an idea put forth um, by the ego, which is our greatest impediment. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that that's horrible because then we look at it and like well enlightenment's okay for other people but not for me mm-hmm. and we have to you know not have to but we it would be beneficial to get to a place where you know it's it's okay to have a, a sense of spiritual advancement as one of the goals that we would have for our lives absolutely i like to i like to talk about Equal opportunity enlightenment, right? <laughs> I think it's really, because it's so important that, you know, we're in a time of awakening in our world and it's important that, you know, we all know that it's, it's possible and, and it's probable for us. And in the yoga tradition, I think a very important distinction that we make is that enlightenment is, is not something that we attain. Um, so that's that's part of that false idea of it not being for me. You know, I can't get there. Um, if we understand it um, in according to Vedic teachings, we're actually already enlightened. Um, we're already as spiritual as we're ever going to get. <laughs> I love that. You know, you cannot. It is not possible to become any more spiritual than you already are. So our spiritual practice, our spiritual life is not about becoming more spiritual. It's about clearing um, the, the mind of its impediments, whatever obstacles are in the way uh, of realizing the truth of our being that is already whole, it's already enlightened, we're already, we're already that, you know. And in, you know, in Christianity, there's a beautiful teaching, the kingdom of God is within you. And it's very similar, you know, this, the wholeness that we're looking for, um, the enlightenment that we think we have to seek, it's, it's within. Well, isn't that just beautiful? Because then it really kind of takes a lot of pressure off because I think sometimes people feel with spirituality and, and enlightenment, 
it's like a never ending journey. You know, mm-hmm. we can see this mountain range and we have to get to the top of it at some point. But, but, you know, I think with the approach that you have, it makes it so much, you know, it takes a lot of that pressure and stress off that if we're already enlightened and that's just opening ourselves up to that, you know, abundance. It is. And then, of course, the, um, if we want to call it the work, <laughs> is, is learning how to live as an enlightened being. Mm-hmm. Um, so learning how to wake up to the truth of what we are and then to live, to live that way. You know, sometimes I, when I'm teaching, I say, you know, it, this is about living in a way that is worthy of us. And, you know, worthy is a charged word. <laughs> so mm-hmm. so I, I use it on purpose because it's not about becoming worthy. It, it's about adjusting our life, our thinking, um, to be in harmony with, with the, in a sense, the high truth of our being. And, you know, most people know that already. You know, most, you know, we know when we are living in a way that's quote unquote worthy of us, when what we're saying, what we're doing is in alignment with that truth of our being. And we know when we're not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, without a doubt, because people, you can feel it. It resonates with you. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, if it's like, gosh, am I doing the right thing? You can feel mm-hmm. if you are or not. Mm-hmm. Exactly. We have this... Um, because we're awake at the core of our being, we're awake. So, so yoga is a path of simply um, clearing away the obstacles to realizing the truth of what we are, and then living in harmony with that truth, and and learning how to to prosper, learning how to flourish, to to let the inner light shine is part of that process. Well, and so when we talk about, you know, the, all of this together, how does this come together with our divine potential? And what is our divine potential? I like to think of our um, divine potential um, as just that. I mean, kind of like you could think of it as like a seed, you know, that's within us. You know, it, it, in Vedic philosophy, this... Um, divine reality expresses as as each individual and within each individual are the potentials of the divine in in its fullness but they require those potentials require our participation in order to be expressed through us in the world i mean just having potential is a wonderful thing, but it really doesn't mean much unless we learn how to cooperate um, with those with those divine potentials. So we have the potential um, uh, to be um, compassionate, to be loving, to be forgiving. Um, we have the potential to prosper. We have the potential to be wise. You know, all of those are divine qualities within us, and when we become willing um which has been you know my experience that i i may not know um, how something is going to come about right but i trust that the divine reality within me and around me knows that and so if i have an idea and i feel that it is dharmic it's it's the right thing to bring forth then i'll take you know one step toward it and i have found that life always provides more than I ever could have imagined. You know, if I was just going to plan something out totally <laughs> on my own, like, okay, this is this is what I can do. You know, this is what I want to do. My vision is never as big as the infinite potential within me and around me that will come to meet me and show me something, you know, so much uh, greater than I would have imagined. So that's divine potential at work. And I just, I love that because that's where, for me, that's like where all the magic happens. That's where mm-hmm. all the beauty happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, those synchronicities, those things you can't predict and, and just, it really, it comes, um, I believe it kind of comes into a state of allowing. 
It does, and it makes life so much sweeter and more enjoyable, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, they don't have to come up with all the answers. You know? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot that we can accomplish um, at the level of will. And, you know, our willpower is really important. It's important to use and and to have the confidence to use our will. Um, but to, as Paramahansa Yogananda, you know, often said, use your will, but use your divinely inspired will. So use it in a greater context. So, in, you know, for me, it's um, like willingness. <laughs> I'm willing, and I'm willing to do all that I know to do, but I'm also open, you know, to being guided, and I'm open to possibilities. I'm open to divine grace, which, you know, we say is the winning combination, and which is our personal effort um, met by divine grace. Mm. That is so beautiful, my goodness. <laughs> mm. And it's kind of where we all want to be, you know, if we want to be honest with ourselves is to kind of be, you know, in this place where we're feeling not just the oneness, but, you know, feeling like we're making difference while we're here as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, coming into that sense of operating with the infinite, um, having life unfold, in um, in ways that are unanticipated, you know, helps to give us a sense of that and, and really to strengthen our, our faith. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, you know, it's necessary for us to have a spiritual practice in, or I don't think that just happens. I mean, it might happen randomly. <laughs> it probably does. But for people who want to live that way um, more predictably, then, you know, I recommend, and it's one thing I really stress in the book, that you, that we need a regular spiritual practice. And, of course, meditation is a foundation for that, to, to regularly let the mind get quiet so we can open our... Um, our consciousness to the infinite. Mm. What a beautiful, I, I love that you said that. And so we're kind of, kind of, um, I'd like for you to kind of break it down for a, a little bit for our listeners. When we talk about, you know, being able to get into a place where we're quiet, you know, we're, we're talking about meditation in, the, in a lot of ways. And I'd love for you to share with us about meditation. Is this something that's really easy to learn? Does it take a long time? Mm. Um, I think it's really pretty easy, although um, people can make it complicated. Mm. And one of the ways that we make it complicated is by um, being too attached to a particular result. So... um, in the yoga tradition, we, we focus on, you know, what we would call meditating super consciously. And that means um, having your attention and awareness be able to be lifted beyond thought activity. And I mentioned before Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. And in there, is, it's really a treatise on, on meditation. In the very beginning of it, he talks about how um, this meditative consciousness, this higher state of consciousness, occurs when our thoughts settle. Then the truth of our being, the divine self, is revealed by itself. And that's so beautiful, isn't it? I mean, that's what we were talking about earlier, that we already are that, and meditation is a natural way for us to experience that truth of our being. So it's a matter of allowing the thoughts to settle. Now, <laughs> there's a caveat to that, of course, which is most people say, wait a minute, <laughs> you said meditation is not that hard, but my thoughts never settle. They're just so restless. I sit down and it's just think, 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 and I'm so distracted. And um, that's true, and that's a timeless issue. But um, the truth of it is that there are very simple tools. So something as simple as putting your attention on your breath 
just watching your inhalation and your exhalation will begin to quiet your restless thoughts. And once that happens, you have a little taste of meditation. And the main thing to know is that meditation is natural. It's natural. It's a natural state of consciousness for us. And, you know, most of us have experienced random moments of meditation. <laughs> like you're, you're just walking on the, on the beach or you're in the forest and, you know, you just feel this expansiveness, right? You're, you're clear, you're calm, and you see things very um, brilliantly and you feel at peace. You're, you're in a meditative state. So this regular practice of meditation is just using some tool to help focus the mind so you can come into that awareness that is beyond involvement with thought, where you're simply awake and aware, experiencing your own beingness. Wow, and you know what, and that's a beautiful place to be. I mean, I personally, I have a meditation practice. I love meditating. It's kind of like little mini vacations for my soul. You know? mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, I think of it sometimes as like letting your soul stretch out, which is, um, you know, it agrees with your idea of vacations. <laughs> it's just like let your soul stretch out because ordinarily our attention and awareness tends to be confined by thought activity, right? We're just sort of, you know, in the past, we're in the future, um, but with meditation, we simply bring our attention and our awareness into the present moment, and then our awareness can expand. Um, and so meditation isn't difficult, um, but, you know, when we think about, you know, well, gee, I should be experiencing this when I meditate, I should be experiencing that, I, I should, you know, be having bells and whistles, um, then, you know, we get uh, disappointed. We become too goal-oriented um, with the meditation itself. The main thing is to have a regular practice, to sit every day, you know, for 20 or 30 minutes using a regular technique, watching your breath, using a mantra. But then begin to look at your life itself, right? You know, are you becoming a little calmer? Are you becoming more intuitive, a little more relaxed? Um, that's the place for um, to look and see if your meditation is having any effect. Well, and, and, and typically you should be more calmer and more relaxed when you're meditating. Absolutely, and, and you will be, and you will be. I think, you know, people just become discouraged because they start looking in the meditation experience itself. And the more you start evaluating your experience during meditation, the farther you get from meditation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have a goal, you know, you, you have an intention to meditate super consciously, meaning just to allow the mind, uh, the um, discursive mind, the sense mind, the thinking mind to become quiet so that you're just aware um, and you can enter that higher state of consciousness. You have that intention, but it happens by itself. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of something that just flows through. It does. It, and, it, and, and so, you know, what we do is we just arrange conditions for that to happen. So we have to show up for it every day. <laughs> A regular time that helps, and you have a little. I say it's kind of like you know falling asleep, right? I can't really teach you how to fall asleep. You know how to fall asleep. Um, it's a state of consciousness. It's a change of consciousness from the waking sleep state to the sleep state. Same thing with meditation. You're you're shifting from this ordinary waking consciousness, the ordinary discursive mind, into um, a higher state of consciousness. But you already know how to do that. So all we do is arrange conditions. Like before you go to sleep, you you fluff your pillow, right? <laughs> you have those little things that you do. And then you, you change your consciousness into the sleep state. So with meditation, we arrange conditions. We sit down. We have a tool that we use. And then meditation um, arises and we enter that flow state of awareness. Mm. 
That, and you know, and that's where people and you, you know you you talk about this as well in your book. Um, you have a whole chapter that's dedicated to streams of happiness and oceans of bliss, mm. where people can really start to experience personal joy where they maybe not have been able to do that in the past. Oh, yeah, definitely. And that's part of abundant, um, prosperous living is learning how um, to experience um, fulfillment, really. You know, I mean, we can we can certainly look around us and see that it's not about how much stuff you have <laughs> because <laughs> people have a lot of stuff. Um, and even really nice stuff, and it doesn't necessarily bring happiness. And so um, in the yoga tradition, we take a sort of a scientific um, viewpoint about how does happiness actually arise? You know, where does it come from? And, of course, you know, it comes from experiencing the wholeness within us. So we learn how to cultivate um, contentment, and uh, one of the sutras tells us that out of contentment itself and our ability to recognize our own wholeness comes supreme happiness or unconditional happiness. Mm. You know, and, and that's really, you know, it's interesting when we walk our spiritual path, it's really where people are looking to be and we kind of talked about this a little bit, is that oneness, but that connection and that that place where you have joy no matter what's going on around you. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, you know, um, I have found over the years in, in teaching about contentment, um, it's a very interesting topic because one of the first things that people come up with and against, I, I, I will say, is that is the question of, well, how can I be happy or how can I be content, you know, when things are so difficult? You know, maybe they're difficult in my own life or when I look in the world, you know, and there's so much suffering. You know, how can I possibly just be unconditionally content in the face of that? You know, wouldn't, wouldn't I be uncaring? I mean, and that's a very real question that arises and it's understandable. Um, and is and and yoga doesn't teach that. It says, learn how to be content within yourself, so that you are able to then access the wisdom and the compassion and the resources that you need um, to bring into life to be able to be a support for yourself and others. If we are um, overcome by pain and sorrow, um, then it's hard for us to access those resources. And that's not to say that we never have grief or we never have sorrow. It's just to say that we learn how to be more skillful in touching those emotions that will arise without being overwhelmed by them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, do you know it? And I know exactly what you're talking about because you know we all go through grief and sorrow, and I can look back on times in my life when I've had that without my you know practice. Mm-hmm. How difficult it is to find your center, you know? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and we and we need that. And I have had so many people tell me too that with the practice, the contrast, you know, when they've gone through. Um, loss in their life or, or profound difficulties, having a practice where they know that their own wholeness and their own deep contentment um, is is not something that is conditional, has made all the difference. So it, it's just like um, we become more expanded in in life you know we can we can experience grief um which is part of our humanity we can experience it without being overwhelmed by it yeah without having having it just be kind of you know oppressive isn't the right word but kind of it feels like just a heavy blanket Mm-hmm. Well, and you know, just not li- not losing hope, and you know, all of that, and and I think to be able to be a resource for others um, is critical. I mean, we look at some of the 
great spiritual teachers, you know, of our time. And um, we look at Thich Nhat Hanh, um, and of course what, what he went through. And he has been a very strong proponent on learning to smile in the face of difficulties so that you you can access your deeper resources and you can help lift up others around you. Is that, I know you, in your book you talk about, you know, overcoming obstacles and thriving. You know, is that what you're also kind of referring to as well as being able to, you know, regardless what's happening, being able to have that clarity? Yes. Um, yeah, I think it's important to, to have that clarity. Always um, I'm pointing back to the deep significance of knowing our own wholeness, you know, knowing who we are as spiritual beings, as our foundation. So that is why um, this um, goal to prosper is connected to Dharma. So it's, it's understanding um, our, we're not, we're not looking to succeed, um, to have something, to acquire something, to get something done so that we will be okay. <laughs> you know, the, the very first premise is that we, we are already whole and complete. We are already divine beings and we are doing what we are doing um, because we're inspired, you know, to make a contribution and to grow and to prosper. And it's natural that we're going to come up against obstacles along the way. Um, but we don't have to take that um, personally. Um, in other words, it's, it's not, um, um, you know, someone or life against us. It's actually always life for us. In, in other words, life is always supporting us in being able to prosper, and, and obstacles can be a part of that, something for us to learn about, something for us to work through. So on our path of prosperous living, we need to learn how to welcome obstacles along the way. I'm so glad that you said that, because I can remember before I started walking a spiritual path, that it, you know, people, you know, I'd had someone ask me, it's like, well, do you think the world is out to get you or is here to <laughs> collaborate with you? And I was like, ooh, it's going to get me. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. But that must be a common thing. Yeah, I, I think it is. And it comes from, of course, an egoic perspective that we're on our own, you know, and it's a zero-sum game out there. Um, but dharmic prosperity is about cooperating with the infinite that is about everybody prospering. And, and that's the big shift I think is needed in our time, that we have a more global awareness, a more cosmic awareness, that it is life is not a zero-sum game, and we don't want to wire it up that way. But, you know, we, we really want to look at this infinite potential that is there um, for for everyone to prosper. My goodness. I mean, we could talk for hours. You're just such a a beautiful resource of just light and information, and I'm so glad that we're here today talking about your book, The Jewel of Abundance. What thoughts would you like to leave our listeners with today? Well, first, I want to thank you, Marianne, for this opportunity to have this conversation with you. It's been it's been so pleasant for me, and um, I, I really want to thank all of your listeners for tuning in. And uh, so thank you so much. I'm really honored to have this conversation with you. Um, I think what I would like to leave people with is this, idea um, that it is natural for us to prosper and that as we come to understand um, what it is to live with higher purpose, to live dharmically, to live in cooperation with the infinite, and then we can understand this 
goal that we have within us to prosper as actually a path, really, of coming to live more consciously and being able to do those things that we dream to do that will be uh, a contribution um, to our own um, success and to the well-being of others. Mm, I love that. I absolutely love that. Oh, my goodness. Well, Ellen, where can people connect with you and not only learn about your book, The Jewel of Abundance, but learn about the workshops you do and all these great things? Um, thanks so much for asking. So my um, author website is a good place to start, and that is ellengraceobrien.com, and it's O'Brien with an A, so it's O B R I. A N Ellen Grace O'Brien all together dot com and that'll take you to my author's site and and that has um a listing of um places where I'll be um really in the next year talking to people about the jewel of abundance, um finding prosperity through the ancient wisdom of yoga. Well, I know you have a lot of workshops listed that are coming up this this new year. How exciting where people can go ahead and participate. And, of course, you have some online courses as well that are year-round that uh, people can immerse themselves in. You know, Ellen, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you so much for the invitation, and um, I look forward to speaking with you again. Well, thank you so much, Ellen. It's been such a pleasure and an honor to spend this time with you. And of course, to talk about your new book, The Jewel of Abundance, Finding Prosperity Through the Ancient Wisdom of Yoga. The Jewel of Abundance is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie bookstores. You can also find it on her publisher's website, newworldlibrary.com. Make sure to check out their book, The Jewel of Abundance, and also all the other great books that they have there as well. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guests and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Marianne airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.